Okay, so before we begin, I am going to answer the first question that you probably have in your mind. I already know it. And the answer is yes. Yes, my wife did dress me this morning. <laughs> I, ha I have to be honest. <laughs> um, okay, so today we're actually going to be in Matthew 25. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and start turning to there. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about myself before uh, we jump into this. Um, Pastor Sam, I kind of ruined what I already had planned, but yes, my name's Travis Lloyd, and my wife's name is Jacqueline. Uh, we actually had our first kid. Her name's Lennox, and she's four months old. We moved here, like Sam said, about a year ago uh, from a small town called Vertigris. It's just outside of... Um, not the metropolis, but the, the city of Tulsa. Um, I do want to be honest here and, and tell you that um, I guess I want to take a second first and thank each person here at Loft. Um, when we moved, we thought it was going to be, I don't know, not that difficult, but it was. We didn't realize um, how important our community was and that when your community is, or I guess you, your community is removed from you, um, how much you actually need it. So, um, and you guys instantly made us feel like family. And so thank you for that. And I guess I would say praise God for his ability to unite strangers to family through his sacrifice. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for being a good, good father. Thank you for your word, and thank you for sending us your son. Today I ask you to enable me to speak your truth clearly. And I also pray that you give us a soft and open hearts to hear your word in your son's name. Amen. So our big idea today is the idea that God gives to us expecting eternal investments. So I want to begin today, I want you to think in your mind, put in your mind a tombstone. And think about what you know about a tombstone. The tombstone contains a date of birth, a date of death, and then a dash right in the middle. So listed above these things is usually the name of the person who died, and then below those things, some kind of statement about that person. However, the main part of the tombstone is the little tiny dash in the middle. It's all about the dash, because the dash is talking about what actually happened while that person lived their life here on Earth. When we meet God face to face, he's going to want to discuss your dash. He's going to want to know what we did that served his eternal purposes. Today we're going to look at a story about three men's lives and what they did with their dash and then God's response to them. So I know they've been talking a lot about what parables are and what they do and kind of what they are, but we're going to re-examine that again. And usually parables are told so that those who care will come to know more truth. Not so much because they fully understand the parable right when it's told, but because they care enough to ask questions and ask what it means after the story is finished. They hang around long enough to have it explained to them. If you remember, the disciples didn't actually fully understand the parables, but they asked Jesus what they meant after the crowds left. They had a soft and open heart. Understanding is an issue of your heart. Those who have a hard heart also have closed eyes and closed ears, and they don't understand. Before we read the parable today, it is important to know a little bit of context, not much, but a little bit. So Matthew is actually written to Jewish people, or you could even say church people, just like you and me. Jesus is nearing the end of his earthly ministry, and he's leaving teaching the temple for the last time. He had his death in mind, and he begins to tell the disciples about this intense persecution that's coming. He then begins to tell them many stories called parables about how to prepare for his second coming while he's gone. Let's look at today's parable, Matthew 25, 14 through 30. This is called the parable of the talents. For it is just like a man about to go on a journey. He called his own servants, and he entrusted his possessions to them. To one he gave five talents, 
To, to another he gave two talents, and to, and to another he gave one talent, depending on each one's ability. Then he went on a journey. Immediately the man who had received the five talents went and put them to work, and he earned five more. In the same way, the man with two talents earned two more. But the man who had received the one talent went off, dug a hole in the ground, and he hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those servants came and settled accounts with them. The man who has received five talents approached, presented five more talents, and said, Master, you gave me five talents. Look, I've earned five more. He's excited. The master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful, you were faithful over a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Share in your master's joy. Then the man with two talents approached. He said, Master, you gave me two talents. See, look, I've earned two more. Master said to him again, Well done, good and faithful servant. You are faithful over a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Share in your master's joy. Then the man who had received one talent also approached. He said, Master, I know you're a harsh man, reaping where you have not sown, gathering where you have not scattered seed. So I was afraid, and I went off, and I hid your talent in the ground. See, have back exactly what you gave me. His master replied to him, You evil, lazy servant. If you knew that I reap where I haven't sown, and you gather where I haven't scattered, then you should have at least deposited my money with the bankers, and I would have received my money back with interest when I returned. So take the talent from him, and give it to the one who has ten talents. For, it, for to everyone who has more, more will be given, and he will have more than enough. But from the one who does not have, even what he has will be taken from him. And the scariest part of the, ser- the, the whole parable, verse 30, and throw this good-for-nothing servant into outer darkness where there will be a weeping and a gnashing of teeth. I'm going to begin um, today, just going to go ahead and make the first point, and then we'll talk about it. So the first point of the day is God gives to all people. God gives to all people. Verses 14 and 15. So the story begins with a man about to go on a journey, and he called his servant, his own servants together and entrusted his possessions to them. So here, Jesus begins the parable by talking about a rich master. We immediately see that this man had great wealth. He was wealthy enough to have servants, to have land, and to have a, a large amount of money. In today's terms, he would have greatly surpassed like the Bill Gates, the owner of Microsoft, or, or the Jeff Bezos, um, owner of Amazon. This man, with all this wealth, wealth actually represents Jesus himself. The term servants here in verse 14 needs to be explained. Back in the days of Jesus, the word servant would refer to like a physical descendant of Abraham. Jews would have believed that being a physical descendant of Abraham would guarantee them entrance into God's kingdom. These men thought because they were born into the line of Abraham that they had like punched their ticket and they were going to heaven. That their spot in eternal bliss was secured. However, the Bible is very clear that the true children of Abraham are those who share faith in Jesus Christ who gave his life on the cross for all people. True sons and daughters of God recognize Jesus as their Messiah. Jesus as their anointed one. Jesus as the chosen one. Jesus as Lord and Savior and the Redeemer of all. We know this from Paul, who tells us this. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision accomplishes anything. What matters most is faith working through love. Circumcision back then was actually a symbol of having the right background and doing everything that was required of you by religion. No amount of work or moral behavior can save us. If a person were trying to find favor with God by being circumcised, he would also have to obey the rest of the law completely. To save ourselves by keeping all of God's law, trying to save ourselves by only keeping all of God's law, only separates us farther from God. So when we are entrusted with possessions from your master, during the time that this parable was told, there would be like an expectation. An expectation that fruit would be produced or maybe that a profit would be made. So there's this idea that these possessions that are being given over, they're not a gift in the sense of like getting a birthday gift. 
you would want to think of it like this. So say you are like the owner of a McDonald's or a business. You find a person. He is fully qualified to run the store. You hand over the keys to him to manage the store. When you come back as the owner, you have an expectation. And your expectation is the, what you, your expectation will be that what you gave the manager, he's going to use it well. The servants, when they were handed these talents, they were aware of these expectations. These servants in this parable actually represent us. We're all people. Looking at verse 16, we can see that each servant was given talents. One servant received five, one servant received two, and the third servant received one. Just receiving one talent alone is very, very valuable. In the New Testament, a talent is actually like a measure of weight calculated to about 50 to 80 pounds. If you're trying to imagine this in your mind, for those of you who have kids, it's about the weight of a 10-year-old. If you don't have kids, it's about the equivalent of nine gallons of milk, if you can imagine carrying all, all the nine gallons at once. Uh, the value would actually differ if it was gold or, silver, or gold or silver, but the buying power here is enormous. One talent of silver was equivalent of about 15 to 20 years' wages. So if you were to try to bring that into today's society, if you were working and you made about $20,000 a year, one talent alone was worth about $400,000. So if you had five talents, you would be a multimillionaire. So continuing in verse 15, we can see that the man, the master, he gave according to their ability so that no excuses could be made. The master divided the money, talents, among the servants according to their abilities. No one received more or less than they could handle. If he failed in his assignment, his excuse could not be that he was overwhelmed. Failure could only come from one of two things, laziness or hatred of this master. The talents in this story represent any kind of resources that you're given, that we are given. God gives us time, he gives us money, he gives us gifts, and he gives us other resources according to our abilities. And he expects us to invest them wisely until he returns. We are responsible to use well what God has given us. The issue here is not how much you actually get or how much you have, but actually how well you use what you have. So a question that you might be asking yourself is, what are these gifts? I know what these other things are, but what are these gifts? Scripture is always the best interpreter of Scripture. So, when you, so looking at a cross-reference here is helpful to understand what these gifts are. Paul tells us in Romans that, in his grace, God has given us different gifts for doing different things well. So if God has given you the ability to prophesy, speak out with as much faith as God has given you. If your gift is serving others, serve well. If, your gift, if you are a teacher, teach well. If your gift is to encourage others, be encouraging. If it is giving, give generously. If God has given you leadership ability, take, take that responsibility seriously. And if you have the gift of showing kindness to others, do it gladly. Romans 12, 6 through 8. It's very important that each one of us uses our gifts well. God actually divides our gifts for the greater good of those around you. Prophets are usually bold and articulate. Servers are usually faithful and loyal. Teachers are usually clear thinkers. Encouragers know how to motivate. Givers are generous and they are trusting. Leaders are usually good organizers and good managers. Those who show mercy are caring people who are happy to give their time to others. It's important to note that it would be impossible for one person to do all these things. When you identify your own gifts, your own gifts and trust me that this list I just shared with you is far from complete. I want you to ask God, how can I use them to build up God's family? And how can I use them to extend God's kingdom? But at the same time, I want you to realize that your gifts cannot do the work of the church alone. It cannot. Be thankful for those whose gifts are completely different from yours. Let your strengths balance their weaknesses and be grateful that their abilities make up for your deficiencies. Together, we can extend God's kingdom. So finishing up verse 15, the man went on a journey. The man being Jesus entrusts people with his possessions, and we are currently now awaiting his return to set all things right. 
However, we need to understand that everything that we have belongs to God. Yes, that's right. Everything we have belongs to God. Jesus is the primary owner of everything and has the authority to tell us how to use our possessions. We, including myself, can often think and act like non-believers. We think that we are the primary owners of our time, our talents, and our treasures. We think that the house that we have is a result of our hard work and our labor. That our job is a direct reflection of our educational achievements, or maybe how smart we are. That our favor in this world is a natural consequence to our unique abilities. We often forget that all we have is from God and for God. We learn in Romans 11 that says, Who has ever given to God that he should be repaid? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. It's easy to lose sight of the reality that all of our possessions are gifts from God. Without him, however, we would possess nothing. He provides you the strength, to, he provides you the strength and health to work. He gives the ability to grasp intellectual concepts and earn these degrees. He grants us favor in the eyes of the world. And the reality is, is that all our possessions are owned by God. So when you receive a gift from God, however, you are the second owner. God never surrenders his rights as the primary owner. So now I'm going to move on to our second point. And this is God's truth that authentic faith works. Authentic faith works. Verses 16 through 18. But before we dive into this idea that authentic, authentic faith works, a faith that is alive, a faith that is active, a faith that is working for the Lord, I need to take a slight detour, but a very, very, very important one. There's a danger here that must be addressed. If there's only one part of today's sermon that you hear, this is that part. There's a danger of thinking that you can work your way into a right standing with God. The Bible is very clear that there is only one way to be made right with God, and this is the work of Jesus Christ on the cross. So I want you to hear God's word directly on how we are made right with him. John 14, 6. Jesus told them, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So we learn here that Jesus is actually the only way to God. Romans 3, 23 and 24 tells us, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And they are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is, in Je that is in Christ Jesus. So all people have sinned. However, all people can receive grace through the work of Jesus. 1 Corinthians 15, 3 through 4. This is Paul speaking. For I passed on to you as most important what I also received. That Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, and that he was raised again on the third day according to scriptures. <clears throat> so you can see here that no matter how many good works you do, without turning towards God and putting your faith in Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, you and God are still at odds. You're not made right in his eyes, and the Bible says that that work is filthy rags. However, he is waiting for every person to call out to him. So now moving back, to our idea that authentic faith works, we can see in verses 16 through 18 that excuse me, these first two servants immediately put their talents to work. The first two servants received and immediately put to work or traded with the time, talents, and treasures given to them by their master. It is actually helpful to look at the original Greek words used here in these two verses. The two Greek action words used for received is a Greek word called lambano, and the phrase put to work is ergosomy. So lumbano actually means to take with the hand, to lay hold of something with a specific purpose of using it. So you would take possession of something with a specific purpose of going to do something with it and not hiding it. Ergosomy means to work, to labor, to make gains, to commit, to produce. So these two servants took possession of the talent with a purpose, with expectations, with great responsibility. They had a mission in mind when their master approached, ready to hand over the possessions to them. They knew their master's wishes, and they were on standby, waiting to do his will. These servants were ready to give back to their Lord. 
They knew that this talent was not for storing, nor for safekeeping, but to make a profit for their king. These two servants knew that the time they had to work was limited, and they were going to make the most of the time given to them by their Lord. These diligent servants recognized their opportunities, and they seized them. You might even say that these two servants had their own tombstones in mind, making the most of their time, their talents, and their treasures for their master. The Apostle James tells us this, what good is it, my brothers and sisters, Christians, if someone claims to have faith and he does not have works? Can such a faith save him? If a brother or sister is without clothes and he lacks daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, stay warm, be well fed, but you don't give them what the body needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith, if it doesn't have works by itself, is dead. James 2.14 Contrasting the first two servants, the third servant buried his talent. The third servant did the opposite of the first two servants. It's, it is helpful here to know that the Greek word, again, it changes. It changes from ergazomi, which meant to work, to aprokomi, which meant to depart, to go away. Aprokomi means a separation, a motion of fleeing or departing, a separation of one thing from another by which the union or fellowship of the two is destroyed a state of separation that includes a distance. So the third servant immediately separates himself from the other servants and including his master. Once he's separated from his master, he takes the time, digs a hole, and buries it in the ground for safekeeping. Burying your talent, in verse 18, is actually an illustration of using your God-given time, talents, and treasure for earthly pursuits alone. He couldn't care less about his master's plan for his talent. He could not wait to get away, to get isolated, to be alone, so that he could pursue the things in life that only he wanted, to build an empire on earth, to make a name for himself, to pursue the things that were important in the here and now and not the eternal. The third servant wastes opportunity after opportunity to serve his master. His sin was the sin of laziness in regards to his master's plan for his life. There's actually no room for laziness in the life of a believer. New believers are actually truthfully taught this, that it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not of yourself. This is a gift from God. It's not by works so that, not, so that no one can boast. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. However, believers can become idle if they mistakenly believe that God expects nothing of them, from, <clears throat> expects nothing of them for the transformation that God provides. For we are work, God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prefer, prepared in advance for us to do. Ephesians 2.10. So we are not saved by works, but we do show our faith by our works. James 2.18. The sin, of the sin of laziness violates God's purposes for us, good works. The Lord, however, empowers Christians, us, to overcome the flesh's tendency towards laziness by giving us what God calls as a new nature, 2 Corinthians 5.17. So moving on to the climax of the parable, verses 19, <clears throat> verses 19 through 30, we actually learn this, and this will be our third point. All are accountable. All people are accountable. Verses 19 through 30. So I want you to look back at verse 19, and it says, After a long time, the master of those servants came, and he settled his accounts with them. Paul tells us this, that for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one of us may be repaid for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. 2 Corinthians 5.10. He also tells us this, just as, it is, just as it is appointed for people to die once, after this, they're going to face judgment. Hebrews 9.27. So once this life is over, we are going to meet the Lord face to face. We are going to give an account of what we did with our time, our talents, and our treasures while we are here on earth. While eternal life is a free gift given on the basis of God's grace, His free and unearned favor, each person, the believer and the unbeliever, will still face God in his judgment, whether good or bad. God's gracious gift of salvation does not free us 
from the requirement of faithful obedience. All will give an account of how they lived. Jesus is coming back. We know this to be true. Does this mean that you need to quit your job? Does this mean you need to surrender to full-time ministry? Does this mean you need to move to a foreign country to serve the Lord? No, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. Um, no, it really just means that we need to use our time, our talents, and our treasures diligently in order to serve God in whatever we do. For some of us, that may mean switching professions. You'll have to ask God. I, I cannot answer that question for you. But for the large majority of us, it just means doing our daily work out of a love for God and a love for Jesus. In verses 20 through 24, we can see that each man approached his master. When Jesus returns for a second time, or your life on earth ends, whichever comes first, there will be no hiding, no running, and no excuses. Each person will approach the master and give an account of his or her life. Everything we do on earth, our deeds, our management of life, will be seen clearly and exposed to God's light. I want to stop a second and highlight in verse 23. The master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. You can hear the master's excitement. This is Jesus when you meet him. The first two servants, they received the same reward. And it was based on their faithfulness, not the size of the talent or the responsibility they got. Know this, the smallest task in God's work may receive a great reward if you are faithful in performing it. Husbands, this could be doing the dishes without being asked. I know. Wives, this could be surprising your husband with his favorite meal or dessert. Children, this could actually be making friends with someone at school that nobody else likes. And then when someone asks you why, you say, Jesus loves him, so do I. Singles, young adults, students. This could be asking a coworker or a friend to lunch and just encouraging them and loving on them and telling them they're valuable. God's word says this, that even giving a cup of water will be rewarded if done out of a love for Jesus. How great will it be on that day when you hear the loving words of your master saying, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful, oh, <clears throat> faithful and trustworthy. Come share in your master's joy. However, we're going to move to verses 24 through 30, and the focus shifts entirely. It shifts over to the third servant. This servant was thinking only of himself. He hoped to play it safe and protect himself from his master, but he was actually judged for his self-centeredness. He tried to make excuses, and he actually revealed by his own words that he didn't even really know the master. He tried to make excuses. Sorry. He did nothing with the talent that was given to him. We must not make excuses to avoid doing what God calls us to do. Do not be fooled. Excuses are very easy to make. Once my kids are grown, then I'll find time to serve the Lord. As soon as I finish school, then I'm going to start working for my master. When I get married and find that perfect person, then I'll focus on the Lord. When I'm financially secure, then I'll be in a perfect place to work for the Lord. Hey, if God truly is our master, we must try to obey willingly. Our time, our talents, and our monies, they're not even ours in the first place. We are only managers. We are not owners. When we ignore, squander, or abuse what we are given, we are rebellious, and we deserve punishment. So we're actually going to finish with this final thought, a concluding thought. And this thought is this. That our work, your work, my work, is evidence of our master. Our work is evidence of our true master. So let's go all the way back to the beginning. Let's think about this tombstone. So now I want you to imagine that this is your personal tombstone. 
What do you want your tombstone to say? Or better yet, what will the master write on your tombstone? Will he write, well done, good and faithful servant? Or will he write, you evil, lazy servant? The servant who prepares diligently prepares for Christ's return by investing their time, their talent, and their treasure to serve God. They will be rewarded. God rewards your faithfulness. God will separate his obedient followers from pretenders and from unbelievers. The real evidence of our belief is in the way you act. To treat all people that we encounter as if they are Jesus is no easy task. Do not be fooled. What we do for others demonstrates what we really think about Jesus' words to us. How well do your actions separate you from pretenders or from unbelievers. Remember this. God is not calling us to be perfect. We know this is impossible. However, God is calling each one of us to follow him wholeheartedly. Let's pray. Father God, you know us. You care about us. God, you are willing and able to help us. And for this, I am truly thankful. Lord, as we're about to spend time reflecting on your word, I'm asking that your spirit help us to respond. Without you, we have no hope. You know the plans you have for each person in this room. I pray that you'll speak to them. Show them your will. Your mission in life gives us a great, great purpose. A purpose here and now and a purpose for all eternity. Help us to lean in to you and fulfill this purpose. We know that apart from you, we can do nothing. I pray all this in your son's name. Amen.